um, let's get going. And um, just, I'd like to welcome everybody who has joined us. Um, we're nearly up to 100 now, so that's lovely. Uh, really well, welcome to all of you. I love, I love the fact that you come in and join us on these, uh, these Zoom interviews. Um, and as usual, we're going to have about a half an hour chat with Janet, um, break, break up into uh, smaller groups so that we can have a lovely uh, opportunity to meet some of the other people within uh, Super Troopers. And then uh, we'll come back for some questions uh, with Janet afterwards. And if Janet doesn't mind, I didn't mention this to you this morning, Janet, when we were having a chat, um, you could go into a group too. Absolutely, yeah, happy to do yeah. that. Yeah. Okay, so you may end up in a, in a group either with me or with Janet or okay. just another lovely no, group. Fine. You. So that's how it's going to work. And um, so it's my very, very, very great pleasure to, to welcome Janet. Um, uh, she was due to join us uh, a few weeks ago and very sadly um, had to pull out at the last minute. So um, I know that lockdown for you, Janet, has been quite, well, challenging for all of us, but for you it's been especially challenging. Could you? Yes. Although actually it was a sort of lockdown of two halves. I mean, John, John um, was diagnosed with secondary cancer uh, about two and a half years ago. So obviously he was shielded. And initially his brilliant oncologist, who we just both loved, um, initially thought that it was best that he stayed out of hospital, no chemotherapy at all. Because at that stage, of course, hospitals were given over to, to COVID patients and also, there was such a degree of difficulty and danger about the, the possibility of people catching it, which of course there still is, but you know, more so then I think because it was such an unknown. Um, he was uh, very short of breath. He had secondary lung cancer, but it was completely manageable. And most of that was because nobody was super worried about it. You know, his oncologist was very much, well, as soon as we can, we'll sort this. And um, Macmillan nurse is exactly the same. So for the first, oh gosh, until mid-June really of lockdown, when you know the weather was extraordinary. Luckily we have a garden, we sat in it every day, we listened to the daily briefing like gathering round for Jack and Ori. And it was actually, um, looking back, a very peaceful time for us. And it wasn't until John was admitted to hospital quite suddenly um, mid-June uh, for what, they're still not sure what happened, but it was, very dramatic, very sudden. He was in hospital for 10 days. And when he came out, he was home, but he was uh, sleeping in a hospital bed downstairs. And uh, he would get up every day. They, they lent us a, a, an electric recliner chair thing too. Um, but it was a struggle for him. That's, that's the only time when I would describe his illness as a struggle because he was on oxygen all the time. And his quality of life was severely reduced. You know, we could see friends. We, he had a portable unit. We would take him into the garden. But looking back now, I think he knew that the end was near for him. And when he was admitted um, at the end of July, although it, it seemed to be that he was admitted because he had um, an infection spike. And again, no particular worry about that, just they wanted to put him on intravenous antibiotics. But after a few days, it became obvious that um, it was pneumonia and it was overtaking. And that I'm sure a lot of people uh, listening, watching this will will know that that's a very common trajectory um, at the end of the sort of cancer that John had. So it's only two months. We have we're in that strange timeline where it feels like yesterday. And yet, when was it? And I think because to go back to your original question, lockdown has done such funny things to our timelines, hasn't it? It's yeah. almost impossible to remember what a normal day felt like. And we certainly haven't had one of those for a long time. No, absolutely. Anyway, um, I'm sure uh, that everybody on this call is, you know, sending you a big collective hug. And you. Uh, yeah. you know. I'm very, I'm so I'm so grateful and moved by all the support. Um, I put up a, a few Instagram messages, which initially I thought, is this the right way to talk about things? But of course, I've kind of lost the person I used to talk to about things. I mean, I've got a lovely family. You know, I've got three children, five grandchildren, loads of lovely friends. But of course, I'm on my own now, and that's very different. And I suddenly thought, I think I'd like to be not on my own, and I'd like to reach out and just send some messages about how it feels. And I've been inundated with people either supporting and just saying come on or saying I understand which is so valuable very valuable it, it absolutely is and I think that uh, the people again who were who are with us on this call um 
when because of lockdown I started uh, Trisha Super Troopers and uh, we've had exactly the same sort of experience through that because I, th I think it's it's this whole thing about reaching out and one of the yeah. things that we mustn't lose from uh, going forward, you know, when, when hopefully COVID is a dim and distant memory, yeah. is this sense that there is this incredible amount of kindness out there um, in the world. You know, yeah. we lose sight of it because we hear all the bad things and, yeah. uh, you know, we, we tend to sort of th think in those terms. Yeah, but actually, yeah. when something like that happens to you, um, a very personal thing like that, or something that is, uh, you know, universal happens like COVID, you you do you do get that there is a lot of kindness and yeah. uh, caring. There's, out there. there's two things, aren't there? there? There's a lot of kindness. There's also a lot of loneliness. And at one point, that wasn't really being matched up. And I think it was people understood it. Even people who lived on their own, and I've got loads of friends who live alone, had said that it was a particular sort of solitary the pandemic you know particularly the first lockdown which was sudden severe very difficult you know full of privations you know were you going to even be able to get an order in could you get your new paper you know it was it was a very sort of urgent thing wasn't it like a kind of sudden opening the oven door and the fire is just huge but I think now we we have calmed to something else which makes going into a possible lockdown where I am anyway in London which I think will happen um feel a lot sadder in a way because we know what it feels like but still with that same universal strength of it is a universal experience but also now you know i doubting the messages i think i mean it's really hard isn't it for, for everyone to understand exactly what happens next because yeah. i don't think anybody knows what happens next no i mean I, I i just feel like i have to get on with my life in the way that i um, I have decided uh, what works for me, if you like, um, taking account of uh, my need to protect others in the process, if necessary. Yeah. You know what I mean? I take my, make my own decisions yeah. as, well as I possibly can. Um, anyway, uh, let's talk a little bit about, um, well, shall we start with, with a, a kind of an overview of your career? <laughs> Um, because I, I did an interview with you. We, we, we um, were delighted to have you join us as an ambassador to the oh, business my pleasure. three years ago or so. And I, I loved it because um, I've, I've sort of followed you through the years with, with great interest and admiration, I have to say. And um, I, 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 we'll come on to it in a minute, but I, I, I'd latterly been watching you on The Right Stuff, where a lot of your opinions chimed with my own. It's always, it's always <laughs> nice to have your own opinions. <laughs> reflected back to you yeah <laughs> I knew that you and I were on the same wavelength let's put it Absolutely. that way you know I love that that thought around aging around a lot of subjects so um let, let's look back over what has been a very long and very successful career in lots of ways but you started as an actress didn't you I and did. then you break into television so tell us how that came about yes I mean nobody in my family was anything to do with with the stage at all my dad was in the army my mother had been a nurse but hadn't really worked since having uh, children, of course, we were being posted all over Germany at that point. And uh, she did go back to work when I was 16, actually, as a nursery nurse, but certainly when I was little, you know, she was not working. Um, so when I announced, I think, age five, that I wanted to be an actress, I don't think I knew quite what it meant, and they certainly didn't know. But I'm amazingly lucky that they were so supportive, right the way through, they were so supportive. And they, they tried to find out what it did mean and what, what it might possibly mean for me. But at no point did they try and discourage me. I mean, they've all, they'd always um, put in place the fact that I needed to protect myself because I think anyone going into the acting profession is, is vulnerable. You know, you, you are putting yourself on the line every single time you audition for anything and you face constant rejection. But of course, I'm looking back now and thinking of my younger self who just used to think, wow, it's gonna be me. <laughs> And of course now, to sort of skip a bit, and now I'm writing, I seem to have chosen two careers where people's first reaction is not great, you know, if you say, I don't know, dentist or something, people go, oh, fantastic, you need more of those. But if you say actress or writer, people immediately frown and say, you know, it's really hard. Mm -hmm. But in both cases, especially with acting initially, it made me just think, well, it's going to be hard for other people, but I've just got to try this because I had an innate sense that um, I was going to be okay, which meant that inevitably I was rejected for jobs, or let's put it there, they chose somebody else. But, um, you know, it, it never felt like it was a kick at all. It really never did. And I just thought, well, there's always next time. And 
and I'd become quite used to that by the time I, I auditioned for and then was was asked to be on Blue Peter. Yeah, and you were quite, were well, you were young when you were on Jigsaw, weren't you, pregnant with Sophie? No, I'd actually just had Sophie. I, th- I think I, I think I probably looked as though I was about to have her, but uh, I'd had a very glorious, but I was 23 when I had Sophie. And I didn't know anyone else who'd had a baby of my age. And I just thought I was the cleverest thing ever. And I consequently gave him to every, every indulgence. So I think by the time I did Jigsaw, which I started work on when Sophie was 11 weeks old, I was still pretty much looked as though she was months away. But um, yeah, she was a very little baby. But again, with, with the sort of, whatever that is, recklessness perhaps, or certainly uh, an idea that the world is gonna be okay for you of youth. You know, I thought, oh, yeah, it's fine to do this for a young baby. And we did four lovely series of Jigsaw, which, um, you know, obviously it's a, it's a project that is very dear to my heart. If, if nobody's seen it, they're excused this bit. But it was um, a game, essentially, um, a sort of wordplay game, which meant basically that, that I and my co-presenter, Adrian Headley, just dressed up all the time as different characters. So it was pretty heavenly. It was a combination of every acting role I'd ever wanted to do, plus the world's best dressing up box. So I felt pretty spoiled. Well, I remember you really well on Blue Peter because um, you coincided with my children's, you know. Oh, childhood. yeah, yeah. It was a very happy time. It yes, so how, how long were you on Blue Peter? Actually only four years, but that's, I think, enough to see out a generation because Blue Peter is aimed and, and still is aimed really square and true um, at eight to 12 year olds. And of course, because it's been running now for over 60 years, it has a vast secret adult audience. And when I was on the repeater, obviously it was still twice a week, it was still on BBC One, there was only whatever that rival program was called, Hello Magpie. Um, you know, so we, we, you know, of course we dominated because there was really no alternative. Yeah. So I think it was an extraordinary time for children's programs and a brilliant time to be doing a program like that. And we had, you know, we were on air live twice a week. So although I say it was only four years, it was it was actually quite hard work. <laughs> it was interspersed with each. I was really lucky. I became really good, genuine friends with the people I worked with, which of course is not a given. You know, it's, it's a job like any other, but we're all still in touch, which I do think is the best bonus. It's lovely. I, I think you were on Blue Peter kind of in the heyday, or at least, um, you know, yeah, I do. I do actually. I call, I call it the golden years, for sure. The yeah. golden years of... <laughs> but I used to watch it too, I know, with my kids, I used to love it. So well, that's it, the thing, you know, because it had been on television. Right. Yeah, exactly, when you, when you were watching the children's programme. You know, so people had grown up with it, and then and then there it still was in, in the corner of the room, and at the same time every single Monday and Thursday. So, yeah, yeah it's a huge and happy part of my life. I feel very lucky. I can, I can absolutely imagine. <laughs> uh, and then, as, as I said, um, the next time I, I came across you was when I, st- I used to watch you know, write stuff because um, I'd get up and if I if I wasn't going out anywhere to work, some days I, I was at home, I'd turn it on and it was on Channel 5 with yeah. Matthew yeah. Wright. Yeah. And of course it was an opinion programme and, and, you know, every now and again, uh, you would be on it as yeah. the, you know, as the, the person to sit there giving your opinions. Absolutely. And um, so how was that? Because that's a very different kettle of fish. Yes, it, it came along at just the right time actually, because after Blue Peter, and it's fair to say that if you've done a programme like you Peter nothing is ever going to be like that again and I, because I joined when I was 28 and I already had a four-year-old child and I was I was pretty aware of the way the world worked and I did think at that point I'm never going to have this sort of attention really because it, that's what it is so I, I did various things after you know whatever I was asked to do from from Top Gear bizarrely to um, Open Air which is one of the first daytime programs to programs about gardening cooking you know jobbing presenter really and then when the right stuff came along, it had only been on air a year. And in fact, it was on air originally for a year in Norwich and it had the same three presenters every day. And then it got brought down to London by Princess Productions and the boss there was looking for new faces to do a week at a time. So initially when I joined, we would do um, a week every, every four weeks. So it was pretty regular. And it came at the right time really, because although it will not be a surprise to anyone who knows me that I have plenty of opinions. Um, I don't think I'd have been, I mean, brave is not quite the right word, but I'd have, I'd have been worried more about the jeopardy of saying exactly what I thought in terms perhaps of my wider career, in terms of, you know, upsetting people. And I, I categorically will say now that I 
never traduce the opinions of my family, of my friends. If we were ever going to talk about a subject which I knew involved them, I would always clear it with them first. So I, you know, I wasn't just went to gob. I don't think I was went to gob, but it was really salutary to me that I, I had all this stuff and rather than rent a small soapbox in, on Hyde Park Corner, you know, I could actually say what I thought and it was great. And what, what made me laugh actually is because we had, um, and it was a program that stripped the week, so five days a week. And every day there was a, a two panelists who, who were on the whole week. And then there would be another daily guest, perhaps somebody who was promoting a book or a film or a play or something. And very often we'd all be in the green room before the show and we'd be just, you know, going through the topics, not rehearsing the program at all, but just you know, the editor would be there running through inevitably there were changes. And somebody would be on the show and in the green room would be miraculously, really, really opinionated about something. And then would appear on screen and bear in mind this is a live program, you know, whatever, 20 minutes later and really rein it in. And I thought, what are you missing a trick here? Because A, it's easier to remember what you really think. But also it makes you more articulate, I think, if you're actually saying what you feel. Mm, yeah. Um, yes, well, as I said, what I was impressed about when you were on was that uh, A, you were extremely articulate, but also you just taught such good common sense, a lot of it, you know, and okay, your common sense is my common sense, <laughs> you know, we're, we're, bound, right. we're bound to like what we uh, what we hear, but um, I don't know, you, you know, you'd hear things and you think, oh, please either get over yourself or you can't really believe that, that kind of thing, but uh, I, I never felt that when you were on. So oh, well, that's great. That no, was... I, I do feel again, because I did that program for a long time. I mean, I joined it I think 2001 and then only finished it you know finished for me um I was on a few times with Jeremy Vine but to be fair to them they have got a slightly different ethos because it's much more journalistic now yeah. so to have people who aren't journalists actually does does throw a bit of a spanner in the works yeah. but with Matthew it was a good long run it was lovely yeah. really good fun good um uh, which brings me to your latest career um, <laughs> Which is writing, and I, you know, I've uh, I've got both your books here, so uh, I'm going to hold them up because uh, I want to talk. Uh, I want to talk to you about them. I've obviously read them both, and um, and found them both very compelling. I have to say, very interesting and compelling books. Um, so what? What me have you have you had you always wanted to write? Because I mean, you know, writing yeah. novels is is something else. I always think. I mean, it's yeah. it's an amazing thing to do. Yeah, um, I had always wanted to write um, and I uh, put so many barriers in my own way. Um, most of them actually to do with fear, you know, the fear of rejection, of looking a bit silly, of doing something that everybody would go, you know, you go back to the presenting love. But also because there is something extraordinarily naked about writing. I mean, you you write too and you you write in a way that is your thoughts on the page, you know, you don't, you don't have any, any filter on what you write. And I know it's the same for you that sometimes you'll be writing something and think, this has just come out of my head <laughs> onto the page. And then with some huge audacity, I'm gonna ask other people to read it, which is still to me quite breathtaking really. And also if you go into any, you know, when we were allowed to go into bookshop, you know, there are plenty of books. In theory, we, we don't need any more. You know, you wouldn't have a long enough life to, to read all the books probably on your own shelf. But I just had so much I wanted to say and it really boiled up. And again, probably because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a generally optimistic person, glass half, half, half full kind of a girl. I think I'm glad I waited until I did to write because again, I had no break on it. I had no curve and Although I do have a brilliant editor, you know, and a great, a great team there, you know, that doesn't mean they ever write the book for you, believe me, they do not. But it also means that I was a lot less inhibited than I might have been 20 years ago, worrying about the actual writing, you know, what are going to, people going to think of my writing, let alone the storytelling. And as it was, it reminded me of going back to acting, really, when I used to do a lot of improvisation, and you're just experimenting you're just letting your imagination go free and once I realized I, I was not afraid to do that then I thought I've, I've got to not be afraid to go further with this and see if I can get a publisher but it's I'm still really, still daunting yeah it's, I'm really interested in what you said there about um, being older was helpful and I, I feel this so much and this is you know the audience that we have here um, it, 
being older is has so many advantages attached yeah. to it and, and it really does you know the world doesn't value it but we can value it in ourselves to give us the confidence to perhaps have a go at something that we've you know to, to scratch that itch that we've always had yeah, absolutely and, you know in in your case to, to come up with two books which are really um i mean really quite complex books in lots of ways <laughs> I, I want to concentrate but both of them have very strong female characters in them strong yeah. you know uh, that that's what you've written around the first one which is called the butcher's took i'll just briefly mention this you were you were nominated in 2016 by the observer as one of the best new faces i know in- that was i can't tell you how heady that was brilliant I, I went along for um a photo shoot uh because i think they featured seven debut novelists something like that yeah and I truly thought, because I got used to it, that I would be the oldest person in the room, and I wasn't, actually. So hats off to them that they were just looking at the books themselves. Yes. But also, you know, what, what a needless worry that that was. You know, it was all about the book. That's the only thing that matters. And uh, the heroine of the, the first book is, is a 19-year-old girl, and it's written in the first person. And it wasn't until well after the butcher's book was published that somebody said to me something like oh you know amazing you know you're writing with this really young girl they say looking at me carefully and I thought well a I was one <laughs> and also <laughs> truly on the page it doesn't matter which is so liberating yeah. so liberating well absolutely um so the, the the book that I you've just published and which um I have read uh, fairly recently um about two, three weeks ago, and I was just going through it again last night, uh, some of the points in it. Again, you've got this very strong female character called Marion, and this one is set in the 1970s. As you say, Butcher's Hook, I think, was set in 1763. So you had that yeah. sort of the younger girl, but also the historical uh, elements of that yeah. to, to be true to. This time you've written uh, very much more, uh, as I said, around that period. And uh, this is a, somebody who is... Um, you could say that she's chafing against a lot of things. <laughs> so she's not totally at one with the world at all and is yeah. very definitely chafing against marriage, um, you know, providing meals for her family. She's a lousy cook. I identified with so much. <laughs> <laughs> I was very much like Marion, I think, in the, in the 1970s in terms of, uh, of, you know, getting the meals on the table and all that. Yeah. But what I'm what I want to ask you about it is it's quite it's very complex from the point of view of structure, by which I mean that you've got you've got uh, four voices mm-hmm. in the book. You've got Mary and her her, um, her husband. You've also got her her daughter and her son Eddie, who's mm-hmm. a, a child, um, and the daughter's a teenager. It's written through a diary, and then you've got Mary in first person, uh, daughter sort of first person through the diary, and then the others are in the third person so you also switch forwards and backwards in time <laughs> so you're writing a multi-layered story which is it which has different time frames in four different voices and I mean I just just I mean it's brilliantly written because Thank you've you. read it in a way that I as a as the person reading it could totally understand what was going on so my question at last to get to you is to say how on earth did you do that did you have to have lots of notebooks how did how did you keep all that going there were there were various standpoints I mean the the, the inspiration for it was um was us really you know women who are, I, I, I'm not sure about the term invisible, because if you ask people for a superpower, they often say invisibility. So that's got to be a good thing. You know, we, we're invisible in the fact that nobody can quite read us anymore. You know, anybody you meet of our sort of age, you don't know what their life was, you know, and as you get older, that's even more true. You know, that you, you don't, you can choose not to reveal absolutely anything. Plus, it's not written all over you in the way that it is when you're young, when, you know, you're looking to your peer group, you're quite competitive, you're looking for partners and jobs and lives. But when you get to be in your 60s and 70s, I think that that's it has a different tempo and you can become the person who looks out very much. But I was also aware that for, for women of Marion's generation who were, you know, sort of in their late 30s in, in the mid 1970s, they were, they were, they could hear the sort of distant drumbeat of women's live, which I think, you know, like, like a um, swing in London happened on pretty much one street, you know, in Chelsea, if you happen to be there. But the, the woman's movement was embryonic, 
but nevertheless meant something. It woke something. It's like a stirring in your blood, even if you can't act on it. And somebody like Marion, who doesn't work, so therefore is completely dependent on her husband financially, who has the regulation, two children, who, who puts up a good show of doing things that she should, and then meets entirely the wrong person, because of course he would be. And it just what makes her want to break out. And it doesn't, it's hard to say, it doesn't make her want to break out, I think, in terms of, of communal women's liberation, because she is, I have to say, really selfish. But it is just being, being given agency in your life, which is so missing. But unfortunately, the, the man she, she uh, lights on is, is an, another um, relic, really, of that era, the, the man who understood that the swinging 60s, et cetera, meant a great deal more permissiveness than he possibly as a teenage boy ever dreamt of, and therefore was free to hit on every single woman. And if she didn't put out, you know, he could accuse her of being either frigid or lesbian or, or um, you know, a woman's liver. So you were really caught, I think, in this weird, it's not all of them, of course, and it's certainly not, it is definitely Adrian in the book, but it's, it's still, I came across it, I'm sure you did. Those, those men who had just learned enough that they could say what they thought were the right things, but they still only had one very old fashioned aim in mind. But it, it means that Marion acts selfishly. She acts in spite of her children. She also reads her daughter's diary, which is, is never a good idea and realizes that her daughter is involved with the same man. So th there is a huge complexity, a huge misunderstanding a lot about mothers and daughters, because that's another subject very close to my heart. Although I have to say, I've got three kids, two of them are girls. Marion is not me, and those girls are not my daughters. I mean, they're, they're far more me than, than any either of my girls are, but certainly that luckily, luckily, that's not our relationship. <laughs> well, I, I did think that because, um, I, you know, I, I've met you on an, on uh, two or three occasions. You've always come across to me as an extremely positive and actually a very nice person. Whereas Marion, I don't think you could say was either positive or particularly no, nice. Exactly, exactly. So it didn't feel like you were writing this about about yourself. But it it is very brilliantly. Um, what's the word, imagined, I, I guess. Mm. I mean, you know, this is what a writer does. A writer, yeah. you know, imagines lives, imagines yeah. characters. And actually, if you can then portray those lives and characters successfully, then it becomes a very compelling story. Um, and that's exactly what you've done. Now, and, you know, and in terms of that multiple um, voices and different timeline, I, I wanted a degree of reflection from Marion. So the, some of the novel is set contemporaneously and actually she's at the bedside of her dying husband. And I'm saying that now that it was written a long time before John was ill. If anything, it's based on other relatives. But right at the end of writing, certainly the first or second draft, I realized I needed his voice. And the main reason for that is because he is a really nice man. <laughs> Yes, yes. And I, yeah, a lot of my characters are not very nice. And also, you know, I was married to a really nice man. My dad was a nice man. And they're very often the ones that you, you get to later. You know, when I was young, I thought I wanted difficult and dangerous and, you know, often very upsetting because I thought that was where my energy was, you know. And then luckily, luckily for me, I met John because he's the nice man. And, and I thought, I, again, I kind of want to to give them a place in all this because it's so important that he's not a pushover at all. He's kind of aware of what's going on, but he's also nice. Yes. <laughs> so that was my challenge to myself really, see if I could actually write a nice person. <laughs> <laughs> I did think once or twice it was too nice for Marion, in fact, because... Yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Well, that probably is autobiographical. <laughs> she definitely wasn't nice. But uh, anyway, so so how it was, and uh, it's, uh, as I said, it's a very compelling read. It's a real... Um, I found it a, an absolute page-turner, Janet, honestly. Yeah, I got yeah. into it, and then I just I just wanted to know the next bit, and the next bit, and the next yeah. bit, which is, what more can you say about a book, you know, that you well, want to keep reading it? And keep going. Exactly. That, that's well, that's uh, very, very comforting and, and heartwarming. Thank you. Well, uh, as I said, uh, I'm full of admiration for people who write novels because I think it's uh, I, th I think it's just the most uh, incredibly hard thing to do. So um, so uh, well done. And thank you. Uh, thank you for writing it. So let me hand over to Bryony now, who's going to ask you some questions. Okay.
Hi, Janet. Um, Hi. We've had four questions come through, so um, I'll get, I think we'll be able to get through all of those. Um, so the first question was from Sally. Um, she wants to know, out of all the things that you've done in your career, what is it that's given you the most pleasure? Oh, that's, that's a bit loaded, that one. That's a bit loaded, because, well, I'll tell you, the thing is, I, I live pretty much, and this is testing this theory, you know, the way I'm living now, but I live in the present quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And I, I tend not to look back with regret because, you know, hiding to nothing really, what's done is done. And so far, nothing dreadful, this is, this is hostage to fortune, as far as I know, nothing dreadful is going to rear up. So I do think that everywhere I've got, I've suddenly looked around and thought, this is amazing. This is amazing to be here. You know, when I got into to Central, my drama school, that was, that was an amazing step. My first job, totally brilliant. So it isn't as though I walk along in a, in a happy, self-congratulatory haze, but it does mean I do mostly think I'm really relishing this. I do feel very lucky. But I have to say, of course, there are various moments and, and probably certainly recently being, being published. And actually, funnily enough, being published the second time because the first time was exciting, of course, you know, because that is your dream when you've written a book. But it was almost too much of an experience to take in, if you know what I mean. So it was, it was exhilarating. It was enormously exciting. There was my actual physical book. But the second time I thought, I've really written something now. I, you know, I, I've actually, I can cross over, I think. I can think yeah. I'm a writer and I've got ideas for other books and I'm not, of course, I'm always going to be frightened of presenting what I write to everybody else. I don't think that'll ever stop. But there was, it goes beyond a sense of achievement. It's just a kind of realization that all the ways that I'd stopped myself writing before, mainly I think, because as I said before, I was scared of it or I was scared of rejection or, being thought of in the wrong way but also because I had a weird 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 feeling that I ought to become somehow a different person you know me as a writer you know and it took me an awful lot of energy really trying to be that writer mm -hmm. and the only reason I think that I've written two books so far is because I realized that the writer is me <laughs> and I just have to be me <laughs> writing so again that that realization that that it is just for me I wrote those books and and clutching especially the second one to my heart was a massive moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess this is a kind of on a similar sort of um, a similar question. Jackie was wondering, looking back at your time on Blue Peter, do you have a memory that was sort of your most fun memory, something that really sticks out for you? So, so many. I mean, it is, it is the dream job, isn't it? <laughs> I think most people would agree. Um, there was a particular film we made, which probably won't sound very much at all, but it felt enormously special. There was a, um, a stately home called Cork Abbey, and we were the first people in it before, I think it's now National Trust, came in. And the family who lived there had been collectors of everything, from literally old tennis rackets to butterflies to suits of armour. And it was the most beautiful place. But the, the big deal things that I did, which I would not in a million years have been able to do from, you know, free fall parachuting to singing at the last night of the proms to meeting heroes <laughs> from Bob Geldof on down. You know, it really was an extraordinary thing to have all that happen. And, and also, as I said, doing a live show twice a week was really exciting. You know, that never stops being exciting. Yeah. Me. Plus working with people who became friends, you know, I, I feel incredibly fortunate. So I'm able to, look, I'm able to therefore edit out the time I fainted at London Zoo um, when we made a film about a cold snap and we had to go and break the ice on the tiger's pond. And I was so cold, I passed out. So, you know, <laughs> there were downsides. And I yeah. didn't really enjoy the, um, uh, doing the rescue from inside an inflatable lifeboat in the Solent. Mm -hmm. I would not go back to that ever again. So, you know, it's not all great. Believe me, it's not all great, but it was, it was still, because of the way the program was and because we were never required to be experts, we were just people saying, oh, they go at that. And of course you were with experts. You know, I can, I can look back on it overall, apart from the comments, yeah. as being a huge and huge and happy part of my life. Yeah. Um, um, Helen wants to know what it's like to also have a famous daughter. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's so funny about that. Is that I think I think that catches catches you in different ways because obviously you know my my three kids are all extraordinary people. I like them very much, which I think is a lucky thing. You know, I, I sort of thought I'd love my kids, but I really like that like their company a lot. But I know um, very early on in Sophie's career, going to a gig, which is all yeah, great because you get the wristband and everything. You just get to the front of the queue. It's great. And then standing in the front, but in amongst a crowd. And when she started singing, they all knew the words. And that was amazing. That was an amazing moment. And the lucky thing is that Sophie deals with her fame really well. You know, she is, she's a smart girl. She enjoys it a lot. She is able to really sift out the bits that matter and she's a brilliant mum and she's you know a very happy woman in her marriage so you know the bits that we connect with as well quite apart from the what she does for a living but the main answer is it's massive massive fun I mean she gets, <laughs> we get to go to the London Palladium and watch Sophie singing I mean it is yeah and she really enjoys her work so I don't have that sort of I can tell her she's nervous when she walks on stage I always have a moment of thinking hope she's okay but usually she is and if she isn't it's for a really good reason but it is very enjoyable it's great yeah. my son's a drama so you know I just I've got the best gigs my, my other daughter is an art dealer so. <laughs> 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 I mean, I too, but it's not quite the same because she knows way more about art than than all of us put together Mm. Um, and just one final question from Sue and um, she wants to know whether you're planning on writing any books or you've got anything sort of coming up any more books yeah I'm definitely definitely writing another book um in fact mm. I was meeting this week with my with my agent to just run my idea past him because he needs to know what it might possibly be about I've just done the narration for a lovely book of the week which is going to be on radio four in the week of uh Remembrance Day celebrations, which is a commemoration of the inauguration of the Tomb of the Unknown Warrior in Westminster Abbey. Mm. And it's a very contemporary feel, that story, the bickering, the length of time it took, who was actually in charge, who should be there, mixed in, of course, with letters from mostly the mothers or the widows of people who wanted that representation of their lost loved ones. Yeah. So that, that's coming up. And then a couple of nice kids things too in the mix. But, one of those is fine, one of those is voiceover, we can do that, but the other one we need to be on location, so yeah. soon I hope, but yeah, meanwhile, um, yes, I'm, I've started another book, I started it quite early on in lockdown, and then not just because John became more ill, but just anyway, I found lockdown a very strange time in, in that the days seem to be both everlasting and incredibly short, <laughs> so I'm not quite sure what happened to time. So I, it's the sort of thing I could go back to. So that that was lucky, and I've got a cast of characters who still make me laugh. So, so long so long as I still feel like that about them when I go back to it, that's fine. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. I'll hand back to Trish now. Thank you very much, Bryony. And um, so the the final thing that I need to do is just to uh, to thank all of you for coming and joining us. It's been brilliant to have your your company, and of course, a big special thank you to you, Janet. Um, you. Absolutely delightful to see you, and uh, and thank you so much for um, for a really interesting and stimulating hour that we spent together. It's been it's been wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank and, you. thank uh, you all for looking after me as well, because it is. It's a very hard time and I, if I'm perfectly honest, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to feel talking about John, but actually it, it felt good. So thank you. Thank well, I'm, very, I'm very glad to hear that. And, uh, you know, you've obviously been very open with us, which, uh, which I think helps. And um, as I said, it was absolutely delightful to spend an hour in your company. So thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you for much. having me. Bye, Janet. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, everybody else as well. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.